Hello and welcome to another episode of Brave UX. I'm Brendan Jarvis, Managing Founder of The Space In Between, and it's my job to help you to put the pieces of the product puzzle together. I do that by unpacking the stories, learnings, and expert advice of world-class UX design and product management professionals. My guest today is Paul Stonick. Paul is a seasoned, user-centered design leader and a self-described creative maverick. For the past 22 years, Paul has worked in visual design. 17 of those have been invested in e-commerce and 15 in leading world-class creative teams, many of which have delivered highly praised award-winning work. In 2003, Paul took on a senior digital creative position at the then 142-year-old luxury department store chain, Bloomingdale's. There, he was part of a special ops team of five who was put in charge of creating the company's first e-commerce website. Within five years, the team had grown to over 150 people and the website was doing over $100 million USD in revenue per year. After Bloomingdale's, Paul went to Avon where he was creative director of the North American online division. During his time there, Paul led the team that launched the company's first mobile app, a massive change in the way that Avon representatives interacted with the company. Since leaving Avon in 2013, Paul has held a number of senior design leadership positions at well-known brands including Viacom, Dress Barn, Barclays Investment Bank and, most recently, at The Home Depot, which is the world's largest home improvement retailer. At the Home Depot, Paul led the team responsible for the UX of the world's fifth largest e-commerce site, as well as the digital extensions of that business, including the consumer-facing mobile app, an experience that Forrester Research rated as the number one mobile app in retail in 2019. He's been described as a, by his former colleagues as a positive role model, an exemplary coach, leader and advocate, and passionate about creating excellent customer experiences that serve both the customers and the business. And it's my pleasure to welcome Paul here to speak with us today. Paul, welcome to the show. Thank you so much, Brendan. That's an amazing introduction. And I want to be that guy you just described. Oh, wait, that's me. <laughs> so much. That was a wonderful introduction. Glad to be here. Well, given the amazing things you've done in your career, Paul, you made that fairly easy for me. So it's great to have you here. And before we jump into some of the, the practice-based um, areas that I'd love to cover with you today, I hear that you're a massive fan of Crowded House and that you actually met the lead singer, Neil Finn. And for those of you that are listening that don't know who Crowded House and Neil Finn are or weren't born in Australia or New Zealand, it was a really popular rock band back in the 1980s and the 1990s here. So tell us, Paul, what was the story there? Yeah, yeah and thank you for bringing that up. And Crowded House is one of my top favorite bands of all time. And I was first turned on to them in 1987 with their debut album that's not popular on the radio and their big hit was Don't Dream It's Over but I had the opportunity to see them in concert at my college at Drew University in 1989. And it was very loose just in terms of how the band was setting up in our gym to play. It wasn't a very big arena, right? it was a college gym, but also an exciting experience. So in between classes, I wandered over to the gym and I'm just kind of milling around. There's no security or anything. And these are different days. And uh, Neil Finn just happened to be walking around and I walked up to him and I asked him for his autograph and he was very pleasant. And I had it all these years, but I managed to have it framed as well too. I know it's a little bit hard to see, but I had it framed with one of their album covers. And he was just genuine and kind and easy to talk to. I still have the ticket stub as well from that concert. Just an amazing experience. And a funny story, uh, someone that I went to college with had this old early model, you know, Toyota. It was all beat up and old and painted by hand. And she had all the members of Crowded House spray paint their names as autographs on the car. It was pretty cool. So one of my top bands of all time, they're amazing in concert and they still tour, they still record, uh, not with all original members, but they're they're amazing. Yeah, and that's, that's high praise. I mean, I, if I remember correctly, you're from New Jersey and yeah. you know, that's the home of Bruce Springsteen, uh, Whitney Houston and, and some, several, you know, the, the Misfits. I mean, there are many amazing artists that come from there. So it's great to hear that an Austral Australasian band is r right up there on your uh, on your hit list. Yeah, you know, Crowded House and Neil Finn are very underrated. Neil Finn, in my opinion, is a god among men and super underrated just in terms of his talent and his gift. 
Um, so if you do have the chance to check them out and listen to them, please do. And for those people that know me as well, I'm a huge fan of NXS being from Australia as well, too. So that's right up there in terms of my top bands, including, you know, Kiss and other bands. So um, <laughs> yeah, I can, I can talk about that and nerd out about stuff like that for hours. <laughs> Well, look, I'll, I'll post the link to Crowded House's albums in the show notes for everyone who's curious to take a look. Now, while we're on the topic of, of music, Paul, I understand that relatively early on in your career, you worked at MTV. How did you end up working at MTV? Yeah, you know, so I started my career in 1998 at MTV. And prior to that, I had gone back to school to study web design and web development. So similar to your story, Brendan, um, I really got my voice and decided what I wanted to do right around the time the internet got its voice as we know it. So when Yahoo came online, I got online. It's like, how do they make these pages? This is really cool. Where did this come from? And so kind of getting under the hood and being very self-taught in the beginning, I went back to school and said, I need to get trained in this. And back in the mid to late nineties, it was hard to find a program in web design and web development. It just didn't exist. Mm. Right. So being able to find that was was actually I was lucky and there was a program near my house. So I went back to school and out of that, I went to MTV and I saw a role there for a production designer and I applied for it and I went in and it was really in the trenches and honing my chops and working on MTV news and uh, MTV mu uh, movie awards and digitizing videos, HTML, traditional web design type of work that I was doing. Uh, and it was always something exciting going on at MTV back in those days. These were the days of TRL. Right, Total Request Live, if you're not familiar with it. You're talking NSYNC, Britney Spears, Backstreet Boys. That was the big thing at the time at MTV. So there's always something exciting going on. And then even when I came full circle and went back to Viacom in 2013, 2014, it was really kind of the same experience as well. And that was a, I mean, that's a really um, crucial period in the evolution of the internet as well, because it was this merging of the traditional and, and the digital worlds. You know, how did that formative experience at MTV shape the trajectory of your career? You know, it was early days for me in my career. So there was a lot of learning. So to be transparent, I didn't really know anything about anything at that point, right? It was kind of my really kind of big jump into corporate world, right? Prior to that, I had graduated college with a degree in art history and a really wicked backhand, right? So I was teaching tennis for a couple of years until I figured out what the heck I wanted to do with my life. So getting into the corporate world was something new and out of my comfort zone. So that primed me in a lot of ways what I was in for in terms of my career directory and trajectory and moving forward, what leadership looked like and emotional intelligence and being able to have organizational savvy, presenting to senior leadership. Those early days were started at MTV and some of my earlier gigs as well too. So um, that kind of laid that path as I figured out what that corporate career would look like over the next 20 years. And it's that, um, I suppose, that experience, that uh, exposure to how the corporate world worked, but also being able to draw on your previous life experience that has really set you up quite well for the leadership positions that you've taken on. And I, I just wanted to ask you about that. You know, is there something that thinking about yourself, uh, putting, you know, putting the mirror up, is there something about even before you started MTV, the way that you see the world or the way that you engage with other people that really has stood you in good stead for those leadership roles that you've since had? Yeah, I think it starts with being authentic and being your authentic self and being transparent. And I think for people that know me, they're going to get the authentic me and you're not going to get anything else but that. And um, I think people can trust me from early on as well, too. And that's something that I tried to build on early on with my team. And to quote my friend, Stephen Gates, I build that from a emotional side and a practical side as well too knowing that i am going to lean in and help you out and remove the roadblocks and then from a practical side i know i'm going to also have you show up and uh, deliver and execute and chip and i'll be there for you as well so developing that trust i think the bigger message when i think about my leadership style is really about emotional intelligence and that's something i was turned on to back in 2003 when i was working at bloomingdale's and we were required to take a course around emotional intelligence. I had never heard of it and was turned on to it through that course and through the works of Daniel Goleman. Uh, so if you don't know who Daniel Goleman is, he's really the godfather of the concept of emotional intelligence and has written a lot of great books, follow him on LinkedIn, <laughs> absolutely amazing. And that's something that has been through my career and narrative all the way through about being aware of your emotions and how they affect you, then also being aware of your emotions in the room Right. When you're in a meeting and somebody is reacting and having a moment, making sure that you don't start amping up as well, too, that how you can stay calm and have a, a, 
a decent reaction, right? That's going to be more productive in terms of that conversation, right? So look, as a boss, nobody wants your boss to run around and be yelling and screaming and dropping F-bombs and stuff like that. That's not my style. That's not how I work. And nobody wants that, right? So emotional intelligence is really about how you can be aware and be in control in terms of what that looks like in a room and for yourself. I would also joke that my emotional intelligence is much better at work than it is at home. <laughs> <laughs> well, I can tell you my emotional intelligence is much better when I've had a good night's sleep. Yeah, agreed. <laughs> Yeah, and look, this emotional intelligence has been a bit of a theme when I was doing some research for our conversation for, for the people that have worked under you. And obviously they have um, said some of those things that I mentioned in the introduction uh, for this conversation. But it re I really get the sense that they feel like you're in their corner. And I mean, leadership isn't something that um, people always want. Sometimes they fall into it. Sometimes they seek it out. For you, did you always want to be a leader? I think I was naturally a leader at that point. I was naturally comfortable being in front as well, too. And if I go back to my tennis days and use tennis as an example, you know, I was teaching 20, 30 people, adults, children, where I had to be in front and lead and lead that particular um, clinic or that particular lesson or that particular camp, whatever it was. I had to be in front and organize and be transparent and be authentic and make decisions or change and think on the fly as well, too. So a lot of that was already established. But um, as I started getting into corporate career, bringing in that narrative of emotional intelligence was really super critical for me to be able to deal with politics and some of the nonsense that goes on in corporate that we all deal with it every day at all different levels, no matter what it is. How can you actually deal with that? And, and that is so important as you try to think about leadership as well. So that was super important for me. You know, I want to come back to something that you said earlier. You mentioned Daniel Goldman's book uh, or books, and I believe Emotional Intelligence is the title of, of one of them. Have there been any other authors or, or thinkers in the space that have influenced your approach to leadership and, and developing others? Yeah, you know, there, there are really kind of four key books, I think, over the last 20 plus years that have influenced me. And I'll answer your question on the last book. Um, the first one is Don't Make Me Think by Steve Krug, which is just one-on-one that you need to have on your desk. If you haven't read it, it's still relevant today, just in terms of basic UX principles. Um, the Elements of User Experience by Jesse James Garrett, of course, is another one that should be on your, on your shelf. Uh, Sprint by Jake Knapp, of course, in Google Ventures is amazing. We can talk about that a little bit as well when we think about design thinking and scaling design thinking at the Home Depot. And then finally, the last book has really influenced me the last couple of years. And the reason why I'm so in tune with it and really resonate with it is that because it's very similar to the way my team was working at the Home Depot. The book is called This Might Get Me Fired, and it's by Greg Larkin. And um, it's written from a very kind of punk attitude as well, which is great. You know, it's got a really direct, honest, authentic tone. And that's who Greg is at the end of the day. But it talks about innovation at large companies and rarely being authorized. And how do you push innovation through when you're dealing with organizations or doing things the same way or politics or people or whatever it is? And a lot of things we were doing at the Home Depot were very similar to what Greg described in his book, just in terms of creating like a secret society, finding like-minded people like me that were interested in scaling design thinking or talking about accessibility and bringing that forward, uh, finding that what he calls the godfather right, or godmother, having that person or senior executive to help clear the roads for you, to help have that road uh, open so you can go in and make decisions and do things and get things done. We were doing a lot of that stuff. We were just using different language, right? And we had that godfather in place. We had what we called a guild rather than a secret society. We were innovating. We were showing the outcomes at the end of the day. And one of my favorite lines from that book is that you present the outcome, not the idea. And that's what we were big on. It was about outcomes over output, right? Because it's easy for somebody in an office to say, I don't like that idea. You can easily shoot it. They can easily shoot it down. But when you start presenting the outcomes and the impact and the value, then you start leaning into what they care about and it becomes a much more grounded conversation with senior leadership about what's working and what's not working. Yeah, and that's fascinating. And I do want to come to your time at Home Depot and, and leading the charge with design thinking and scaling that and also this um, this notion of outcomes over outputs, which is something that I know from our conversations on LinkedIn before you're on the show that you're really passionate about that too. But j just sitting um, with this uh, 
this leadership uh, area just for just a little bit longer. So there are, and this is a kind of a, a similar conversation or, or a question that I posed to Ryan Rumsey, who I believe you know, um, who was on the show last week. And that's for someone like yourself who went from being a design practitioner to a leader of other design practitioners and a design leader. You know, yeah. what would you say to someone who's found themselves in that position, maybe by chance, or someone who's aspiring to occupy that position? You know, what advice or essential ingredients or anything can you share with them? Yeah, that's great. And yeah, just to cap on, uh, you know, a question you had asked earlier as well, too. You know, when you do enter that leadership path, and it could be either craft or people, right? Whichever way you want to go, those paths are terrific, right? But to answer your your most recent question about early days of leadership, it's really for me, it's about going to back to what I was saying earlier about being present, being visible, and being authentic, right? You have to be able to learn. You have to be able to listen, right? And if you don't do those things early, you're not going to build that trust, right? So you have to make sure that you're going to present yourself in a way that you're accessible to your team. And you have to be comfortable that you are going to make mistakes, right? It's not going to be perfect every single time. And when you are working with your teams, right, you have to tailor to the situation as well. It's not going to be a one size fits all in terms of how you're managing and leading your teams. So whether you're managing up or you're managing sideways, you're managing down, you have to tailor to the situation and have that um, capacity to be able to run with it. So that would be early advice is say, hey, you know, be able to tailor to the situation, be visible, be present, be authentic. And that will that will certainly help you in your in your uh, road of, of leadership. Yeah, that's really great advice. So shifting gears now and talking about the time and your experience at the Home Depot, I mean, you're credited largely with the uh, scaling up of design thinking, and it was through a particular method in design thinking called the design sprint. You know, what was it about design sprints that really captivated you and made you want to really get behind that as an initiative and scale that up? Yeah, you know, I, I can't take all the credit. I have to share that with um, Brooke Catalinic. Uh, who I would recommend you should have on your show as well too. She's amazing. And um, when I got to the Home Depot, she was already running the program of Designs Friends along with Ryan Johnson as well too. And they were doing an amazing job at the, what we called um, squad level, right? And just in terms of inline innovation. And I was already a big fan and I knew what I could do and I knew the output of it, you know, it was absolutely fantastic. Low risk, low investment, creative problem solving for all. And you just need to take the word design out of the title of design thinking. And you know, that you, that's essentially what it is. It's creative problem solving for all. So when I got to the Home Depot in 2017 and recognized that this was already happening, I said, fantastic. I said, Brooke, this is all you're gonna do all the time. You're promoted. I want you to do design sprints and design thinking. And we're gonna take over Home Depot one design sprint at a time. And that was our mantra, right? How do we actually get it out of inline innovation map it to the way we were working of this new kind of squad and community format where we had adopted the Spotify model of working, empowering others and creating this center of excellence around what that could be for design thinking, and then scaling across the organization, right? So not only did we start within IX or interconnected experience, but we wanted to go to HR and finance and supply chain and all these other teams across Home Depot, teams that we never even heard of or knew what they did. Right. And it's like we need to work with these teams to help solve problems because not only about a digital prototype, we were using it as a way to come up with strategy or process or organization, other things that weren't necessarily tangible. It's like we can actually have this type of outcome. Um, so we were successful that way. And then also working with our Home Depot University, creating a custom course where people could come in and take a design thinking one on one class. And I credit Brooke Catalytic and a couple of the people from the team putting that together and, and working with Home Depot University to get people to come in and take the class. And when I first looked at the roster, I'm like, who are these people and where do they come from and what group is that? I don't even know what that is. So the word on the street was starting to spread and that we were onto something. And I was super excited about that. And not only was it uh, within Home Depot, but within the industry, we started getting recognition as well too. So we got invited to UX Strat and Google Design Sprint Conference, How Design. We started getting to, invited to these big conferences to speak about the success we we're seeing in terms of scaling across the organization. Um, we also had created inline training as well too, facilitator training for people that wanted to expand their tool set, 
I want to learn something new that makes them more marketable, right? Or allows them to grow in their careers at the Home Depot. That was a new facet that we had added as well. And I think our vision had really culminated in early 2020 uh, when we were tapped along with our enterprise partners to do a facilitation session, session with our executive leaders. So ELT, in your room and corporate officers cut across different rooms. So no pressure. You've got your CEO, your COO, your CFO, SVPs in the room, and you're talking about design thinking and pushing past the obvious. So if you just kind of sit back and think about that for a second, this is where the secret sauce came in about changing mindsets, changing behaviors, how we can solve problems, right? A completely different mindset. So talking to my COO and telling him to push, push past the obvious in terms of what we're trying to do here, that's a kind of a difficult conversation to have, but you can see during that session, the eyes light up, the magic moment hit, people were thinking in a different way and it was this hugely successful. So to have that type of success, to get all the way up to your ELT and facilitate sessions across big problems that were facing the Home Depot, I am super proud of that. And just one of the most amazing experiences uh, when I think about my journey and my career. Yeah, I mean, that's really an example of what brave being brave in UX is all about is getting in the room with the C-suite and, and showing them the, the value that they can get from a methodology like that. And I think for people that are listening, Paul, uh, I mentioned in the introduction that the Home Depot is the largest home improvement retailer on the planet. But just to put that into perspective for people, can you just give us some quick little facts about how large that actually is? Yeah, so at the time... Um... It's about 450,000 associates. So that's not only corporate, but also in-store. And uh, 2,100 stores approximately across the US and Canada and Mexico. And uh, it's a $120 billion company. That's with a B, billion, right? And the fifth largest e-commerce site at the time that I was there was about a $10 billion site. We had grown the business from 7 billion to 10 billion over three years. The mobile app is wrap at this point just amazing size, scope, and impact that we had at the Home Depot. And it's a company that's values-driven as well, too. And you hear about values, and you, hear, you see them on the wall of different organizations as well. But we had something at Home Depot called Bleeding Orange, and that was really leading in terms of who we were as an organization, leading into those values, whether it's taking care of our people or respect for others or giving back. Right? Those are things that were important to the organization. Right? And then also, which also aligns with what UX is about, you also have the inverted pyramid. And at the top of the pyramid, it says customers first, right? And it's all about the customers. And when you think about what user experience is about, right, that's what we need to do. We have to think about our customers and create that empathy and understand those wants, needs, and frustrations and behaviors. So the founders, uh, they, those were the, the best gifts that they gave us, were just in terms of the values and that inverted pyramid, because the mantra was, you take care of our customers, you take care of our associates, and everything else takes care of itself, right? And that's the beauty of, of the Home Depot. So amazing organization, amazing company. I'm proud of my time that I was there. Yeah, no, it sounds really, really amazing. I want to just come back to the, uh, the, the effort to scale this within the organization now that people have a sense for just how large it was. And you talked about being in the room with the C-suite as kind of the... Uh, the the killer outcome, you know, that sort of culminated this whole effort that you'd been on to get it to that stage where you had that buy-in. But for people listening to this, they are also going to be interested in the journey. Now, I know when you're selling this, you mentioned to people across the organization, we talk about outcomes, less about process. But can you share with us reflections back on uh, some of the the highlights or the challenges that you experienced in the road up to that C-suite meeting? I have to say it's a rare experience because our road, our path was pretty clear to get there, right? So going back to what I was saying earlier, I was very, very fortunate to have a boss in place at the time. His name is Pratt Vimana. And he had cleared the way just in terms of what UX meant, the importance of product, and um, socializing that all the way up to the top, creating this road for us to really drive a Mack truck through and say, we can bring this forward in terms of how we're working. So like I said, when I got to, to Home Depot, the process was already in place. I just helped bring it forward and scale it across the organization. And um, there's a key story that I, I'll always remember. 
and this happened before I got there, but Brooke loves to tell this story as well too, is that there was a design sprint that was done around paint and the vision of paint and the future of paint and what that could look like. And it was so well done, the outcome was brought to the CMO at the time and he looked at it and was walked through all the information. He's like, why don't we work like this all the time, right? Knowing that you know, when you get to that eyes light up moment of saying, this is amazing work and you did it in this time and low risk, low investment, it's a great story to tell because then you're showing the outcome, right? Here's how it actually maps back to the bigger strategy. So I think one of the, the challenges we did run into though with design sprints, it wasn't all rainbows and unicorns, of course, as well too. And there's a lot of things to be proud of, but as we started doing more design sprints, questions started to rise as, why are we doing a design sprint? Does this need a design sprint? What well, qualifies a design sprint? Why are so many people locked into a room for three to four days and so often, why, why aren't they working on these other things? So those are things we had to start addressing in terms of the day to day to make sure that we could actually defend why we're locking people into a room for three to four days. And so people aren't surprised by it at the end, say, hey, we, here's what we've delivered. I didn't know about it. Why are we building this? So those are the things we had to start addressing as well too. And then thinking about what's the return on investment when it came to a design sprint. So we were very fortunate uh, to have two gentlemen that I work with that were in the strategy team uh, within Interconnected Experience. These are former McKinsey guys and they brought a different way of thinking to the table that allowed us to start kind of crunching down exactly what we need to do, figuring out opportunity cost and you know, the overall investment in a design sprint. When you think about time and effort and logistics and things like that, we we're able to really come back with a calculation and say, here's what this design sprint value is at the end of the day, working with our product partners to figure out the value of that particular feature or experience, right? Then also measure how much is actually going to, going to launch. Here's the digital prototype, right? But is that actually going live into production? So measuring that metric, and we had an 82% metric of going live into production. We had a speed to market benefit as well too, where we were getting things out into the market 10 to 20 days faster. So once you start kind of measuring those to actual numbers and outcomes, right, and, and detail, that goes back to what I was saying earlier about the impact, then you start talking about things that leaders care about. And I can start having conversations with my business leaders about, well, here's the impact that's driving and here's the value or the KPIs or whatever that measurement is, here it is, and this is why we should be doing it. Yeah, so it's almost like you were able to wrap a, 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 an outcome calculation that spoke their language, the language of the business to justify the investment in doing the sprints, but also from what you were saying there, Paul, to determine what to run sprints for and what not to. So when you were speaking previously about scaling up design sprints at the Home Depot, I heard you describe a realization that you needed to change the language that organization, the organization was using to talk about what was going on. And in particular, that was about failures being renamed to learnings. Now that to some people listening could seem to be a, a trivial change, but how important in your experience as a leader in design is language and either enabling or disabling positive cultural change. Yeah, you know, you, you hear the term fail fast all the time, right? And that's pretty common um, through the industry, larger organizations, small organizations. But the way we positioned it at the Home Depot was more of a learn fast culture. And it's just a quick switch in words that has a much more positive outcome as well too, and just a positive frame of mind. So that allows you to move forward and say, okay, we learn from this, how do we iterate? It's not that we're gonna stop, right? Learn means I can actually take something away and improve on it. Fail fast almost sounds like it's a dead end. Even though you can iterate and get better at it, learn fast just feels like it's more positive and I can take something away and put that back into the next loop and, 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 and move that forward. So when you think about innovation within large organizations, and, and what that looks like, you can actually start bringing that to senior leadership, right? Here are the outcomes and here's how we can innovate. And like I said earlier, to quote Greg Larkin, innovation in a large organization is rarely authorized. And sometimes you just have to take a risk. Sometimes you just have to go and do it, right? And there was an acronym I used to use all the time in different organizations where it's JFDI, right? Just having to do it, right? Because if you wait for approval or if you wait for this, it's gonna be 18 months, it's gonna be outdated and you'll be behind anyway. Right, so sometimes you just have to take a risk and do it and ask for forgiveness later. But if you can present the outcome, 
right? Then you're having a much more grounded conversation. Or if you can show the math at the end of the day, whether it's implicit ROI or relative ROI, once you start having those conversations, then the innovation really happens, right? Because now you, everything opens up, right? And you're able to move through and do something that's really different. And when I talk about innovation, I talk about innovation, not just like a little bit beyond BAU, right? If you're just doing something a little bit beyond BAU, what are you really doing, right? It really has to be this eyes light up or magic moment that creates a difference for the user at the end of the day. That's who we need to be serving. Yeah, I mean, it's such an important point to make, isn't it? It's this alignment of people's understanding behind the words that you're using, whether they are uh, the words that business is used to using or the words that design is used to using. But you have to find that common ground. And this is something that I explored with Ryan Rumsey as well. And, and he, he's in completely in alignment with your, yourself about just how critical that is. Now, I just want to come, come back to this um, notion of... Uh, uh, innovation is really approved within large companies and sometimes you just have to get on and do it and one of the conversations I've had locally here was with a large um, supermarket chain and it was shared in, within, a, within a, a forum so I'm not going to name any names but the, the, the frustration with, with that person was within that position of leadership was that COVID when that happened it was almost like innovation was happening in rapid at a rapid pace like people were reimagining supply chains they were rethinking the customer experience they were pushing out massive improvements to their apps and to their online experience within two three weeks things that just the regular pace of business would never happen and that's obviously a rare um, forced condition that has been placed upon all of us um, possibly not sustainable but if we think about language and we think about other conditions that might be useful to enable this innovation to happen at the corporate or the really large business end of town. You know, what else have you observed as being really critical to you know, getting those gears uh, going and, and getting people in that mindset of not just incremental, but in those larger, uh, larger big step changes of innovation? I think empowerment and trust at the end of the day, you know, at the Home Depot, we were faced with a similar situation as well too. When COVID hit, Everybody's gone remote and we were caught flat footed a little bit just in terms of curbside pickup, right? This is a large endeavor, right, to, to, to launch. And while we had talked about curbside pickup for some time, we needed to get it out there because this was a human behavior now that we had to address. There was a change in customer behavior. It was expected. Competitors were get, already had it in place. So how do we get there? And... Uh, an amazing cross-functional team. It had to be 50 or, or more people involved in curbside pickup. It's not just about curbside pickup in the app, but you're thinking about logistics and supply chain and workforce and everything else. There's so many things to consider when you're dealing with curbside pickup, right? It was really about getting out of the way and trusting your teams and letting the teams go. And we launched curbside pickup in seven days, seven days right? That's unheard of to your, what you were saying earlier. Things are happening at light, lightning pace. I think if we didn't have COVID, that probably would have taken us 18 months <laughs> to get out the tour, right? But to do it at that speed, and we started small, right? And that would be my advice to companies as well. That doesn't have that road where you can drive a Mack truck down. You know, it's like, you got to take small steps to get there and start small and show those wins, those outcomes, the, the, um, the changes that you're making, not only for the user, but also also to the mindset and behaviors of the organization and starting to get that traction and tell that story. So starting curbside small with, I think it was five stores, and then we scaled to 10 stores, and then we scaled out to 1,000, and then to 2,100. I mean, it, was, it just went on and on because we learned from what we were doing. Plus, we were eating our own dog food, right? And going to the local Home Depot and doing curbside pickup and what was working and wasn't working. And it was actually a beautiful thing to see, too, because the empowerment was there, like even store managers setting up curbside pickup because all the marketing and the signs and everything out wasn't out there yet. Taking a Homer bucket, putting a stick in it, handwritten sign, curbside pickup this way, right? That is just great in terms of everybody rallying around the mission and the message that we're trying to do and take care of our customers. Going back to the inverted pyramid, which I was talking about before, we had to address this new human behavior. And that's really the definition of an outcome at the end of the day. What human behavior are we affecting or driving that provides business value, right? So how can we actually prove that? And we were able to by providing this wonderful service and letting the team go and leadership getting out of the way, politics and all of the other stuff, just letting the team go and decide and get it done. That was a huge difference. 
Yeah, I mean, isn't it amazing that the sort of unifying force that COVID had in, in these large organisations and their ability to get things done? And I sense, a, a, particularly in New Zealand, because we've escaped the worst of the pandemic, there's a return to that normal mode and a bit of frustration from those leaders and those businesses that are perhaps more like a creative maverick like yourself that 18 months to get something done is just almost like sort of pulling the hair out just wanting to get you know wanting to get progress made i just i wonder if there are any ways that you can accelerate uh, and create that alignment and that urgency more quickly but but i haven't really come to any great answers there yeah, I think it goes back to what we were saying earlier. I think, you know, if you can use either low risk, low investment methodologies, you know, to help you get there, um, that can show the win, that can show the value at the end of the day and take that small risk or small chance and do it in incremental ways to start getting traction and building that confidence like Lego blocks in a way as well too. You know, that's what stuff you have to start telling and telling that story up and telling it frequently as well too. So putting those slides together, telling the story, here's the actual outcome, and then get into that frame of mind of translating that impact into what leaders care about. And I think that will help you get traction. You just have to build it incrementally. So starting slow, building on, getting that confidence, and then help, that will hopefully get you more traction as you go along and more, let's say, empowerment or trust right, to do these things on a larger scale. You know, it really sounds to me like you're describing the process that UXs use to understand users and have empathy for their needs and reflect back to them things that are going to solve their problems back on the business and really using those skills to speak that language. Yeah, you know, it's the way I like to define user experience is not only about the satisfaction between a product and a user, right, but it's also about creating emotional connections. And that's so important when you think about how a person shops or interacts with a brand, when you think about loyalty and trust and connection or likely to use again or CSAT or whatever your measurements are, right? It's about creating these deep emotional connections with the customer. And I think one of the, one of the most interesting projects that I worked on where I really started to understand what empathy looked like, right? And what frustrations, needs, and behaviors had to be garnered, right, to pull together something useful for our uh, representatives when I was working at Avon. And so at the top, you had mentioned about the, the your Avon mobile app, which we launched, and we actually launched that in eight weeks, right? So that was a pretty high bar to get something out the door in eight weeks. And it's funny, in Greg Larkin's book, he basically says, if you can't ship in eight weeks, don't bother, right? You know, so basically get it out the door. But it was at that point where we started doing research with our representatives and talking to representatives and listening to them and this is the way they were putting food on the table, right? This was their livelihood. And at that time, Avon was a very archaic organization in terms of representatives using paper and catalogs and faxes and stuff like that. We were getting our butts kicked by Mary Kay and Orban and Sephora was innovating in the space, even, wasn't, even though it wasn't direct to consumer, they were doing a lot of innovative things in the digital space. So again, that very kind of maverick idea, working with my, uh, my boss, who was the president of online, we need to get a app out the door quickly, right? And so listening to our customers and what they needed, you know, that was that kind of turning point for me, you know, going back almost 10 years at, the point, at this point in the early days of mobile, that was the big difference to say, hey, this is really gonna make a difference in somebody's life, right? And that is a human behavior that we can affect. That is an emotional connection that we can speak to and create for these Avon representatives. So I'm super proud of that one too, because it wasn't about the return and um, the speed we got it to market. It was about how we changed human behaviors. It was a changed how, uh, how Avon representatives work. We modernized the workforce, right? That's a big cultural transformation within an organization. Yeah, and it's interesting listening to that story as well, because you've spoken again about a sort of a sense of urgency that you were able to tap into alongside the empathy that you were painting for the user, but you were putting it in context for the business about, um, you know, getting, getting killed by your competition. And that's also something that executives really understand and, and really want to address. So there might be something in there for, for people listening as well. Like if you can associate your endeavor, if it fits with a, something that's serving, solving an urgent problem for the business, that is also maybe a way of getting change to happen in that corporate environment at a faster pace.
Yeah, you bring up a good point because the work has to map back to the mission, right? It has to map back to the bigger strategy of the organization. So going back to what we were saying earlier regarding impact and having that grounded conversation with leaders, the work still has to map back to something tangible. So whether it's OKRs, OGSMs, or whatever the measurement is, right? The work that you're doing within that strategy has to map back to the bigger strategy so that you can map it to real-time numbers and impact. So if you can tell that story and show where that is driving, that's going to make a big difference in terms of that story as well too, getting buy-in, getting trust, right? And then you can start telling that story at the end. This is how we drove the strategy through this particular experience. This has changed how we work, right? This is, these are great things to talk about you know, in terms of how you're changing the business, but how does it map back to the bigger picture and some sort of investment? Now let's uh, shift our focus into a particular area of innovation that I believe you were quite closely involved with at Home Depot, which was the consumer facing app. And it was one of the, the first apps, I believe, to use voice search and augmented reality in the way that consumers were able to experience the product range and solve some of the problems that they had with identifying certain parts that they had to, to replace in their homes you know on the on the ground like what was um what were the conversations going on about the adoption of this quite new technology in in the industry that in which you were working you know the the app team first of all i'm super proud of the app team world-class product engineering design data science everybody that was involved in the app for the home depot super talented and they did an amazing job and that's why it is what or i should say was the number one mobile app in retail is rated by forrester in 2019 it's amazing right but the thing that, you know, about the app team in general is that they were very empowered right there was a lot of trust there right and a lot of buy-in in terms of what we were doing um so new features like for example augmented reality right that was a new feature that was built as a exploration by one of my talented designers. It was something that he was kicking around and, and doing and presented that and say, this is something that we can actually build into our app with AR kit. And he just did a couple quick prototypes and ideation using just different types of imagery and said, here's what it could be, right? You know, so taking that, um, that, that type of thinking, right? Empowering and trusting the team to try new things and do different things. I would say certainly helped in the, the growth of it and adding new features when you think about voice and image search, wayfinding is amazing within it as well too. And you know that's primarily what's happening when you're in store as well too, is that it can take you to the, the bay, it can take you to the aisle. You know, that's the beauty of the app as well too. But even if you see any of the national spots running on TV within the US, it basically starts here. You have to see somebody using their phone Right. And they're figuring out they're using augmented reality or they're going to change paint in their room or they're figuring out uh, what part they need. and They don't know what it is. Then that's driving the whole interconnected experience. Right. So whether they're buying online or they have to go in store and pick up that thing, you know, that was the beauty of the app because it was so it was so embedded in terms of what interconnected retail meant and the bigger strategy, which I was talking about earlier. That was the beauty of it. And it's just one of the most amazing things. And you know, people that I talk to all the time say, oh, I love the Home Depot app. That thing is amazing. And, and it really is because it really solves a lot of problems for the user at the end of the day. Paul, you mentioned you have a bit of philosophy, JFDI, just effing do it. And that really resonates with me, although I've always considered myself a bit of a maverick as well. And that's why I'm, I'm an entrepreneur. But I can appreciate that when you're operating within a larger organization, that maybe that carries a greater risk to your own career with it when you do when you do that, when you run with things and you sort of ask for forgiveness later. It yeah, seems yeah, like it's it worked. Go ahead. I was just going to say, it seems like it's worked fairly well for you, that attitude, but have there been situations where you wished that you hadn't just effing done it? Yeah. You know, so um, when I think about JFDI, it's about cutting through bureaucracy, right? And when you get into large organizations, you know, it's everywhere, right? And sometimes you can't escape it and it comes from all angles. Right. But I use it as a way to kind of cut through bureaucracy to get shit done. Right. And it's usually low hanging fruit as well. It'd be like, hey, we need another license of this particular tool. JFDI, go and do it. 
uh, we need more freelance dollars to do this particular project. JFDI, just go do it. I will go to bat for you. That goes back to that emotional trust I was talking about earlier that I'll remove the roadblocks. I'll take care of that and figure it out. And if I get a slap on the wrist, I'll get a slap on the wrist. But we don't want to slow down progress and getting things done you know, when it really just comes down to common sense, right? This is just common sense we're trying to cut through, right? When we think about JFDI. Now, there have been instances, for example, when I worked at Avon and we were building a site um, around uh, baby clothes and baby items and things like that too. And um, I did a JFDI moment where I needed more people to help build this thing. And I went way over budget just in terms of what we needed for design, but um, it was worth it at the end of the day. It was a fun site. It was cool. It was different and innovative. And, you know, but, you know, that was a, one moment I look back like, oh, I may have gone a little bit too far because now we're tens of thousands of dollars over budget. <laughs> right. But we, we figure out and, you know, I didn't lose my job over it. And uh, as the book says, this might get me fired. But sometimes if you're going to fire me for that, then, you know, then we should have a conversation. <laughs> <laughs> well, it sounds like you've always developed fairly good relationships with your, your more senior managers. So that obviously helps if you, you do end up in a bit of a situation like that. Paul, if there was one thing that you could tell creative people that are working inside large organizations that would make them more successful, what would it be? I think that's a great question. I think you always have to be willing to learn, right? And take feedback, right? And it's always good to get feedback from other people as well. Um, you need to look up every now and then, kind of like Ferris Bueller, right? If you don't look up, you might just miss it, right? So you have to look up and take a moment and say, okay, if I take the blinders off and I think about things I need to get better at, what are those things? And being able to identify that. You have that kind of reflective moment about, what are my strengths? What are my weaknesses? Uh, what do I stand for? Where can I get what? Where can I get better? That comes back to personal brand and creating a personal brand for yourself as well. And that's something you want to do early on in your career. Now, your personal brand might be different five years from now as it is today, and that's totally fine. It should evolve, right? As you grow, your brand should grow as well too. But it's what you want to become known for. And so, if you can lean into that and create that kind of story or elevator pitch or knock out those four or five bullets, that's terrific because that will help keep you grounded. And then that will also help resonate to tell your story, whether it's up or this way or wherever it is that you become known at a talent review. So if I go to talent review and I'm reviewing associate XYZ, people should already know who that person is because they have this brand, right? And they have this awareness and they've told that story over and over. They've been visible. They've been out in front. I've been able to help provide that as well that will tell a much different story, right? So I should be able to go to talent review because you have this personal brand, you have this awareness. I shouldn't have to be able to, I shouldn't have to show one design slide. I should just show the outcomes and here's what XYZ delivered in terms of their value at the end of the day, right? So think about personal brand, crafting that, what you want to be known for and what you don't want to be known for as well too. That's going back and being reflective and thinking about your strengths, your weaknesses and what you can bring to the table. Yeah, I really love that focus again. You've brought on <clears throat> leading with the outcome over the over the process or the design itself. I think that's really key, and that's definitely been a main takeaway for me from this conversation. Paul, are you up for playing a quick game? What kind of game is it, Brendan? <laughs> <laughs> you are the first person to ask me a question. I love it. I love it. So the game's really simple. It's called what's the first word that comes to mind so i'm going to say a word and then you're just going to tell me whatever pops into your head okay all right are you ready love it the first word is design thinking problem solving next up we have outputs files <laughs> and finally crowded house i don't want to use don't dream it's over because that's too obvious so i'm going to use a deep cut it's called she's she's goes on google it all right we'll put that in the show notes <laughs> hey paul thinking about the immediate future of experience design what are you most excited about when I think about experience design in the future, certainly excited about 5G and the advent of 5G and what that means for experiences on mobile phones and how we're going to harness that technology and create these amazing things, you know, through our devices, right? Knowing that this is basically where people are going to be living. 
in some research that we were doing when I was at Home Depot uh, in Asia, it's really mobile only at this point. We're not there yet. US is following behind, right? But eventually, what will mobile only look like and how does 5G support that? Um, computer vision, right? And what does that look like in terms of computers that can see? You know, I think that's super exciting in the work that Amazon's doing when you think about taking something off the shelf and putting it in your cart and, and calculating. I think that's exciting. I think voice interfaces as well, too. Um, it's becoming more commonplace where we're talking to machines and they're talking back to us. And sometimes they're not always correct, right? But there is traction, there is research showing, right, that we're going to be talking to machines more regularly. So how sophisticated will that be down the road beyond just turning on your lights and locking the door? So voice user interfaces and people that are involved with that, I think there's huge traction and opportunity there when you think about career or a different way uh, of using your design skills or thinking about content strategy as well. So those are three areas I'm particularly excited about. A lot of amazing non-screen based opportunities that, that are coming up for people in our practice area to get excited about. Paul, look, thank you. It's been such a great conversation today. I really appreciate you being so generous and sharing your knowledge and your experience with us, with our product and our UX community. And I really can't wait to find out what you're up to next. Thank you so much, Brendan, for the time. It was a lot of fun. Pleasure being on the show. Uh, thank you again for your time. Paul, for people that enjoyed our conversation today, what's the best way if they wanted to contact you to get in touch or connect with you? Yeah, feel free to connect with me on LinkedIn. That's where I live most of the time. You can follow me on Twitter as well. Uh, but LinkedIn is the primary space. So feel free to reach out. Wonderful. We'll post your LinkedIn in the show notes as well, Paul. Thank you once again. And to everyone that's tuned in, thank you as well. It's been great having you listen to our conversation. Everything that I've covered with Paul today will be in the show notes, including where to find Paul, any of the books or other resources that we've mentioned, and links to, to Paul's website. If you enjoyed the show and you want to hear more conversations like this with world-class leaders and practitioners in UX design and products, comment, leave us a comment like the video, subscribe to the channel, and we'll keep them coming. And until next time, everybody, keep being brave.